and how birds survive these really rough stretches. I I am Mark McKellar. I, I sometimes I forget to introduce myself because I know we have new people every week. So I want to make sure that I do that. I'm Mark McKellar. I own the Backyard Bird Center in Kansas City, Missouri with my wife, producer. Oh, she's on that side right there. there. Melanie is in, on, on with me tonight and she's going to try to help me with uh, showing people's messages and try to speed me up from having too much of that, uh, taking too much time away from what I really want to talk about. So again, we we keep evolving. Uh, the the office or the new studio is uh, is up and running, and we are am in Kansas City, Missouri. So uh, always want to remind people of that because we are here in the middle of the country, and when we talk about dates and migrations and things like that, uh, timing. If you're to the north. You may be, it already may have happened for you, or if you're to the south, it may be a little bit later, things like that. So just keep in mind, because uh, people wonder where I am. And, and and always remember, all this information is in the description below the video. Um, it's got all our contact information, the store information, our online store, which, of course, is a big help if you choose to support us. Um, it is It helps to pay for these videos, and it keeps us... Uh, and, uh, so that we can keep producing them. So we thank you, and uh, we always uh, welcome you in, and thank you for your support, and and you, uh, you know, with your uh, comments and your likes and your shares, all that makes a huge difference and, and keeps us going. We've grown tremendously. Um, I, I, I'm most excited about us. Uh, we are uh, closing in on one million views, which I think is a, a fantastic milestone. So. Boy, we got a lot of people chiming in. That's great. Uh, you want to start clicking on them, Melanie? Or? Yeah. Now it's going to be my clicker over here. We're just going to click and say hi to people. Yeah. Just, yeah. All right, Andrew's backyard birds is in. Oh, you got the bird bath. I recommended. Excellent. It is the best. I know. I, I mailed another one today. Uh, that heated bird bath. We're going to talk about that here about surviving winter. I mean, if, if, oh, yes, Sandy uh, suggested everybody chime in with the favorite bird they had this week. Excellent. I, I put in American tree sparrows. It, it's funny because uh, us, it's being a new yard, every new bird, every, every new bird that I, I see outside is a new yard bird. And I love keeping uh, a yard list and it's just starting all over again. So I'm up to 23 species now for the yard. We've been here about three weeks. And the storm has certainly uh, that we've had has certainly brought them in. I, I know you guys are chiming in from all over the country, uh, so I know weather conditions are highly variable. And so, uh, but I do know that the greater part of the lower uh, in, in forty-eight states, uh, you know, are gripped in a a, a pretty strong uh, polar. Uh, the plunge, as they call it, into our part of the country. Even my daughter down in Myrtle Beach is uh, freezing today, and she's supposed to be even colder tomorrow. So uh, wherever you are, I know that uh, you're experiencing pretty cold conditions. I guess maybe the most extremes in the southeast and southwest, maybe not. But uh, you guys up north, Mario, and you and, and some of our friends from Canada, whoa. I know you guys are dealing with it right now. Uh, you know, wind chills here have been well, 30, 40 below, maybe 45 below. Um, and, you know, we, we are not used to that. And it, it, it is much lower. All right. Tips backyard birding. Four bluebirds, two parents, two offspring from my first nest ball. Wow. Where are you located? I wonder where that is. And, 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 uh, you know, uh, for the most part, in, in, in the heart of the country down here, the bluebirds that we see in winter are not the birds that nested here necessarily, and quite often not likely. Uh, we see a shift in them. I talk about this a lot, how our bluebirds and bluebirds in this part of the world, they shift to the deeper south in the winter months. And uh, bluebirds from the north, uh, you know, Minnesota, the Dakotas, and southern Canada, places like that, they have to get out and retreat, and they form flocks. Generally, they're in, in small flocks to medium flocks. And they're the ones that we usually see in our area and in, in the heart of winter. And then that shift uh, that goes back up in north at the uh, during the month of February. They'll start shifting back north. There can be resident birds still in our area uh, during the winter, but a lot of times it is birds from the north. That's what uh, that's what bird banding uh, data tells us. And um, it, it's you know, of course it's very hard to tell one bluebird from another, just like it is from one cardinal from the other. So. Hi, Gary. Hi, Gary. And, and, and I saw Kurt chimed in too. Kurt, I'm going to show a, a Kurt uh, 
video here in a little bit. So I uh, carry my store manager or a good friend of mine. So hi, Daryl from Rhode Island. I hope you've got your, uh, Daryl, your dad got, their grandpa got your uh, bird bath working. I'm really worried, wondering about that because he was, the temperature was getting way too high in that. So I was hoping he got that taken care of. All right, Indiana, you guys are great. Oh, man, it has been. <laughs> yes, Starlings, are, yeah, Starlings kind of came in this week. Uh, they uh, they get pushed in just like everything else, and the unfrozen water is a big attraction. Then they find the sewage, and I don't. I'm lucky, knock on wood. I don't have a ton of them yet, uh, yet, but we call them the motorcycle gangs. They come roaring in, all in black, and they're bullies, and they run other birds off, and they make a mess in the bird bath. You ever look at the bird bath after a bunch of starlings have been in it? It looks like a mud pit. Uh, they are dirty birds, uh, and, and uh, man, it's. Uh, it's quite a sight, but okay. Like, fortunately, they're not in it. And somebody, uh, one of my friends, uh, lives close to the store, commented the other day. A good thing is they do eat a lot of grubs uh, out in your grass that uh, eat your grass roots and stuff. And yes, they do. You see them probing a lot out in grassland areas, and they do eat a lot of those grubs. By the way, so hi, Lisa. <laughs> Working bulldogs. Uh, Ruth is a big bulldog fan. Rusty Blackbird. Had a new verse. Excellent. Outdoor. Yeah. Rusty Blackbirds. And we're going to have talk about them. I'm going to have a couple of pictures of those in there. It's really interesting how, uh, ooh, out of, out of Merlin hunting your bird feeders in Colorado. That's awesome. Merlins are a, a little prairie, a little falcon that doesn't get the, uh, you know, the publicity that prairie falcons or peregrine falcons do. Uh, but they've made a good comeback in this country. Hey, Carol. Good to see you. Right, thanks for joining in. Southern Ontario, close to Detroit. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Lisa. Lisa, hello. From Southwest Michigan. Joshua, you're a regular. We've had a deep snow. I know you guys have had some snow up there. There's... Oh, yeah. Hi, Steve. I know Steve's on. I saw it. I'm sorry. Things are kind of going by. But, yeah, Steve left us a wonderful review on Google. And if you want to help out, our business, any small business that you uh, patronize, believe me, a good Google review, a good Facebook view, uh, review are two things that you can do that really helps that uh, that, that small business because that any more than it, it, it counts for so much. People read those and look at those. And when you guys chime in with a good review like that, it helps it helps small businesses out. So I definitely want to promote that for sure. Look at this with explosion yeah. of house finches. Oh, yeah. And you know what? The, the house finches are, are the number one bird in our backyard. This new yard. I always talk about all my, my and I put my videos up of all the goldfinches in my our old house where we lived for 15 years. Well, I've only got a couple of goldfinches I see any with any regularity here. But boy, we have the house finches. I feel for you. 73 today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You surely you need the, the, the no melt suits down there pretty much all year round, I bet. Backyard breeding in Paulding County, Georgia. All right. Hello, Steve Perry Fever. The starlings are trying to take over my figure. So put it in the cage. Yep. Hang, hang goes that suet upside down. Put the cage in. Use cage feeders. Use safflower. The anti starling. All right. Well, what we're going to do, we're going to get started. And, and, and we're going to, Melanie's going to keep clicking on the, the messages and stuff. And I'll try to keep an eye on those. And, uh, but they, <laughs> it's central Alabama is very cold and snowy. It's, it's all over. I mean, it's snowing outside right now. It's not, not heavy. It's a light snow, but we've got snow falling down right now. Oh my goodness. So, but we're talking about how birds deal with the cold, this harsh weather, because we all feel sorry for them. Our parental instincts take over and we just feel sorry for not just, not just birds, but all animals that have to live and, and people that have to be outside working and living this time of year. Um, but it, birds are it, like most wildlife are much tougher than we give them credit for. And they have a lot of adaptations that uh, are, and, and keep, help them to survive uh, and, 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 these this cold weather and some of them even thrive in it you know you think about juncos i mean juncos nest a lot of most of our juncos nest really high up the top of our planet <laughs> up at the uh, edge of the tundra and and all and and for them it's cold and it, it's cold there a lot 
And so when they come down here, this is like a summer vacation for them a lot of times. So they, of course, they're more adapted. That's like high elevation birds out in Colorado and the West where uh, it gets really, really cold at night. You know, some of them have uh, different adaptations. But first and foremost, what makes birds able to survive really harsh weather is they're warm blooded. They're like you and I. They can make their own body heat. So if you are feeding birds, hopefully you are, uh, and you pro you're providing them a food source, then they are able to make their own body heat and generate and, and stay warm internally like you and I. Uh, there's a great picture of a, a chickadee eating a mealworm. And, and mealworms are mostly, pe mostly people feed those during the bluebird nesting season to, to help their bluebirds. But mealworms in winter are important. I mean, they, you know, dried mealworms and, and my Carolina wrens and my bluebirds come in and get them. And of course, the starlings like them. There are a lot of birds that will eat them, chickadees, titmice. Um, uh, but they don't forget your mealworms in, in the winter. But keep feeding birds. That's the number one thing that you can do to help them. Because, it, like I said, as long as they can find that food, then their body heat, they can generate it and they can survive. But they do have some other really cool adaptations. One of the one of the, mo uh, the, the most obvious that we see all the time are feathers. Feathers are, you know, we have fur as mammals. They have feathers. I love this picture. This, is, this, this, this picture generates so many thoughts. And, and one of them, of course, is uh, it, it's we get calls, people saying, oh my gosh, the Cardinals are so big, or that Blue Jay was huge out there the other day. And Mario sent me a picture of a, of a fluffed up uh, goldfinch uh, from Canada uh, up at his camera the other day. And But what they're doing is, is generating air pockets, air space inside, uh, 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 around their feathers and, and between their feathers. And, uh, and that air is extra insulation. And they do the exact same thing when it's 110 degrees. They fluff up like this as well because that insulates them from the heat. This insulates them from the cold. And so feathers are an incredible adaptation um, and helps them to stay warm. And we know on the out, you know, we, when we the feathers that we see on the outside of a bird, we call them contour feathers. And then, of course, they're wing flight feathers. And I've done whole programs on on, on feathers, so it, it learned the different types of those. But the the key one here is the down feathers, and that is the fluffy ones that we don't get to see. These are the fluffy feathers that are underneath. The, the the outer contour feathers. And those fluffy feathers, and those are the first feathers that a, a, a baby bird gets whenever, after they hatch and they are growing feathers. They, they These down feathers are to keep them warm and to keep, because a lot of it has to do with that, how fluffy they are and how much air pocket space is in there to, to give them extra layers of protection against the really bitter cold from outside. So um, we all know that, you know, it, it, I'm sure, well, maybe maybe it's, maybe it's not as a big a thing as it now would insulate some of these other uh, materials, but uh, down coats were the, the the warmest things that you, you could get for many many years. And sailors wore you know down vests and you know in the cold weather and the Arctic explorers and things like that. And those are clothes stuffed with down feathers. And the most famous down feathers of all. The 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 co the warmest of the down feathers are eiders. Eider, I've heard the term eider down. Well, eiders are uh, very far north sea ducks, and they live in very cold conditions uh, uh, up there where they nest up on the, uh, the edge of the Arctic North Sea. You know, and places that harvest their feathers. What they do is they have these farms where the 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 eiders breed, and what that uh, the females do is they pull out their chest feathers, their down feathers of their chest, and line their nest with them where they lay their eggs. And that way, when they sit on the eggs, they have these what are called brood patches. And the brood patches that are so that their skin can make contact with the egg so that she can transfer her body heat to the eggs. Whereas if it was just her feathers touching those eggs, then she wouldn't be transferred because they're very good insulators. So um, the down feathers, uh, it's a, this is a common eider. There's several different species of eiders on, around the planet. This is the one that I've seen up in uh, Maine uh, and bird watching up in there. And I've seen it in England. Uh, they're circumpolar, the eiders, all the way around the planet uh, in the very northern climate. So they are hardy, hardy ducks. They dive deep 
um, and, and they live around the ocean and they're very much oceanic ducks. But that's where the term eider down comes from. And down feathers are really, really important to all birds uh, being able to stay warm in this weather. Okay. So, say hi to Morgan. Can we? Well, hi, a Morgan. Hi. Hey. We do a couple I don't know Morgan to check in on this. Excellent. Look at this. This was real close. We had a bald eagle in the Coves neighborhood. I meant from Amanda, Barry Road. Yep, right down the street. Yep. Uh, I, I've seen them over my shopping center, which is right beside you. Uh, I've seen them flying over while checking the mail. And uh, the, it, it, the eagles occur on pretty much any body of water in the winter down in this area. They, they, they at least visit it, and some of them stick around uh, longer than others. It's a question. Why are my bluebirds already checking out my bot this nest box? Well, uh, this was going on before it was, got cold, both male and female. Well, one thing, you know, uh, the bluebirds will actually roost in a box at night, and that could be what that was. They were checking out your box as a potential place. They may be sleeping in there at night. Uh, there's some very famous pictures out there of, of like 8, 10, 12 uh, eastern bluebirds uh, all stacked on top of each other, kind of in a circular shape in a bluebird box, keeping warm. Chickadees will do that. Other, some other birds will too. So uh, that is, a, it, it's a pretty famous thing. It's really early. It depends on where you are. Now, if you're in, you know, South Alabama with Steve or in Florida, they, they may start nesting this early, but typically not. I mean, they, they, I would think more that um, it could be just flirting, but I think they're probably checking out the, the, the at a, a potential site to roost in at night. So Check out this one. I don't know if that's Joshua. We had a harlequin duck. Oh, very, very good duck. I love them. Show up on Southern Lake Michigan, diving in the icy water. The harlequin ducks are a, typically more a, a Western duck up in the Pacific Northwest. I've actually seen one in Maryland years ago. Uh, stunningly beautiful. The males are just really beautiful ducks, but they are cold water ducks, and they they do turn up in the heart of the country in, in the winter sometime. I'd love to find one here in Missouri, and Hatton, and it's, not, it's been many years since we've had one here, documented here. Hi from New Orleans. All right. You've got two winning buff-bellied hummingbirds. That's cool. Yeah, that is a beautiful hummingbird, uh, typically in the, uh, found in South Texas and those areas, and uh, but they, uh, you know, it, I'm telling you, things change. You know, birds are expanding. So I can keep going. The, uh, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. All right, next adaptation. We talked about feathers and how cool they are. We're going to move on to uh, something else that they do. One of the things that uh, people don't think about, uh, but one of the ways that we keep warm as mammals is we shiver. You know, we, and, and shivering is your body's reaction to uh, cold to, uh, to warm you up. You, you, you're vibrating and you're, you're, Muscles are twitching, and you're and you're actually creating warmth, and, and that the birds will do that. They have that same thing, but you know the the one of the the big mysteries of you know, uh, uh, wait, wait a minute, we'll talk about feathers one more time. Think about the, uh, when the while the eider picture is up here. You know, it and other waterfowl like geese and swans and birds that live in cold water. Because this is going to be the whole new next thread of this conversation, of this this lesson is that how do these birds survive in this ultra cold weather of uh, water? How do they stand in water and not die? I mean, and not freeze to death. And how do they? Well. They do add feathers in winter. Sometimes uh, uh, the, it's like you putting on us putting on an extra layer of coat uh, going into winter. A lot of waterfowl, actually, especially waterfowl, all birds, but add extra feathers. Uh, tundra swans is an example that's given a lot. That, that uh, in winter they have about twenty five thousand feathers on their body. Uh, nothing compared to the emperor penguin, which is eighty five thousand feathers that you know to to survive those at the South Pole over winter in horrible conditions. But um, yeah, they do add feathers. They actually do that. And you know when I uh, where this is leading me to is two conversations. Really, yes, keep providing water, and and you know, obviously they have to have it. You know, you see all these birds coming. The, Bluebirds have been at my bird bath constantly for the last uh, couple of weeks now, and, and and people it always generates the question of, you know, aren't they isn't it dangerous for them to get in the bird bath? And and I'm and I'm afraid that uh, you know, they're going to freeze and get hurt. Well, and Kurt, 
uh, I got a video of his that I actually loved to death. I want to show it to you. I can't talk during it because it mutes my my microphone. But this is uh, a rusty blackbirds that we, we talked about just earlier uh, bathing, and you can from the just the visualization of the conditions, you can see how cold it was. I love it. They uh, the rusty blackbirds are not that common in, in this area. Uh, they're far northern blackbirds, and they uh, the boreal forest, boreal bo bogs, and mar uh, up up to the north, far north. They move down to this area in winter, and they mainly hang out in wetland areas, in wooded wetland areas. But in these conditions, they get pushed into where they can find unfrozen water. And for food, they'll feed along there as well. Now, how do you tell them the difference between those and a, like a red-winged blackbird, which is about the same size, is that bright white eye. Uh, they're about the same size and shape. They're smaller than grackle. They have, you know, they have a tail, but not a super long tail like a grackle. But that white iris should jump out at you. And they had, they with the name Rusty Blackbird, as you would expect, They in the fall, they have a lot of brown in them. And then moving into winter, they tend to, they start to get the, the, the black starts to fill in. But boy, when you see a bird that's, that's that size, uh, you can, uh, you can get you to look at it and look it up. And it's, like Kurt asked me about it when he sent me a picture and it, sure enough, he had rusty blackbirds bathing in his, uh, in his water uh, feature, which is a great addition, but it was so cold. But these birds know what they can do. They know that they can bathe in cold conditions and not freeze to death. They have to uh, preen their feathers. Now, not some birds are more adept at it than others, obviously. So, but how do they stand in that freezing cold water and and not succumb to uh, bad conditions? So, it's a, it, this is the where we get into uh, the the scientific adaptations a little a little bit. You know, a, a, a little, little some science here. I need to want to. I got to get my. I need the microphone. Sorry. Oh. Need to, I mean, I need to get back up here. Okay, how they, how do birds stand in cold water and and not freeze and not and not get shock? Because typically, you know, the the cold, your feet get extremely cold. Just ask all those people that were at the Chiefs game last Sunday night. Um, and you know, we're warm blooded and, and our we're creating heat and we're pumping warm blood out of our heart, and so are birds, all to the part of their body. Well. This cold water, there's cold feet that are standing in water that their blood gets really cold and that, that blood is coming back to their heart uh, uh, through their veins and arteries. And they, uh, and they the, the parts of the, the, the circulatory system known as capillaries, which are really tiny transition, really small um, the parts of our, our veins and, and, and arteries and they where they come together. Well, in birds, it's, they, those are intertwined really close together. And what that does for birds, that cold water, a cold blood that is coming up from their feet meets that warm blood right up against it that's coming down from the heart, and it warms up that cold blood so that it doesn't go up and put the bird into shock. That really, really cold blood would hit their, their heart, and they, it could be a problem, but they're adapted to do that to stand in this cold water. Then, And remember, birds' feet are covered in scales, so they repel water really well. So they when they fly off and they flutter, Water just immediately, you know, uh, sheds off of those feet. It's like, snake, like a snake scales. It, it, it looks very much like that. All right. Here, let's see. I have moved. Hey, Dan Allen feels like negative 28 in South Dakota. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, yeah, Pine Siskins, we're taking a bath. They know what they can do. They have to bathe. I'm sorry, this Melanie's is, this reminding is where we. This is where we are. Okay. Oh, okay. Talking about bluebirds nesting or roosting. Yep. And he's got them roosting in her box at night. This person sent you a bald eagle picture. That's right. Yeah, Sandy, you had that. You sent a ball, eagle, a beautiful eagle picture. It was a, it was a standing on something, and I don't know what it was, but it this was. A, a question. Eugene from Kentucky, thirty-five miles south of Louisville. House finches and cardinals are keeping my feeders busy, but all my suet feeders are being ignored. Yeah, so that's interesting. Um, I, I, that's a real hard question to answer. I personally, in my forty years of feeding birds 
have never had the greatest luck with suet. Um, I, you know, I'm not the huge proponent of feeding it because I, I've not had a, a ton of luck with it. I, 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 we like my, the peanut feeders. I usually have those out as well, as well as the suet, and they tend to get more attention. And, and I think, you know, I, you have people that certainly uh, will chime in about how busy their, their suet feeders are, and they certainly will be. So I don't know. It, it's, it's highly variable. You know, I, I really encourage high quality suet which is uh, only the suets that contain peanuts uh, and other nuts, maybe some fruit, but stay away from you know, the ones that have a, a cheap bag of bird seed dumped in them. Uh, but I, as far as why your birds are, are not reacting to it as well, that's a hard one. I mean, hello, West Virginia. I have my feeders next to brush, which seems to keep the birds comfortable being near it and bouncing back and forth. Would that increase in the risk of pretty... Here, the, the, you're doing the right thing. Uh, the only time putting your feeders close to a brush, it, 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 it put them in danger is if you have cats. Uh, cats use brush and brush piles as uh, um, ambush points. And uh, so that and, and, and people who come in and say the cat neighbor's cats are killing my birds. And one of the things we recommend is keeping as much seed off the ground as you can and keep your feeders away from the brush. Whereas when it comes to Cooper's hawks and shark chin hawks, uh, natural predators like that, we'd like that cover to be closed so they can quickly get in and out. It makes them feel much more confident feeding. So, um, of course, again, like when I get to talking about cats, people sometimes don't like my opinion, but I, I, cats belong indoors. They are not natural parts of our environment, and birds don't know to fear them, and uh, they kill hundreds of millions of songbirds every year. So keep your cats indoors. Have more luck with bark butter. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, pure suet, Alyssa, I, I used to carry, and, I, and it, it depends on where you live, but pure suet, actually get so hard and so brittle and really cold conditions that it's very hard for the birds to break it off and it you know, it, it, it'll break off that that bark butter or uh, uh, tree icing as we call it we, we that's a spreadable suet and spreading that into crevices like in into the bar, uh, the, the bark of a tree or on feeders that are made for that is, is a great and I think the birds like that better and I'm a big uh, advocate of the of the suet logs I like that far better than just the cage suet feeders. And that's what Steve just hey Steve <laughs> hot pepper suet logs makes it it's very popular yep constantly you're filling the logs and holes in the trees I've even said red kernels clinging to eat it absolutely those, those suet logs are awesome. And uh, Steve, I'm going to have to be switching to the hot pepper ones here because uh, the squirrels have decided that they want to get into my suet log I have hanging on my deck and I just have a, a regular formula in it. So I think I'm going to be switching to your hot, the hot pepper ones you use because uh, I need to keep those uh, those squirrels off that suet. Hi, Mario. Lots of goldfinches and morning doves. Excellent. Yep. You're, then, you're way up there. I know you've had some weather. Let's see. I wanted to show. This is linked. I'm trying to link the product. The oh, okay. Log. The suet log I was just talking about. Melanie put up a a, 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 a link to it up there. It's in the can. The, let's see. Here's where we are. There we go. Pine warblers are thick on the peanut box. That's cool. 15 plus at one time. Where are you? You must be like in Florida. That's right. You're in Florida. I guess they, they have that many pine warblers and palm warblers. They overwinter down there. Tom, Absolutely. The nut hatches and chickadees struggling to get suet when it's below zero. And that can be that that, that suet can get really hard uh, when the, the temperatures get that low, and especially pure suet. Uh, that's why I like to have some ingredients mixed in that will help uh, not get so hard. Let's see. Hey, Mary Lou. Yeah, so do the starlings. Yeah, that's it. Remember, starlings are in the winter when it's stressful. Boy, they come in. They really come in, and they and there's a lot of them. They love the suet. All right, she's gonna put that back up there again. Okay, where was I? Okay, so birds can get in water. They get they have that adaptation with the capillaries in their legs, so they don't freeze. And they uh, and, and they you know they're uh, I add this picture in there because the. <laughs> This is a great picture of a bald eagle, amateur bald eagle. That at the, I don't know, you can't. I, it's hard to see, but he has a chunk of ice in in his uh, talon there, and he's trying to get to a dead fish that's under the ice. 
And so he was landing and breaking the ice pieces and, and actually picking them up and carrying them and dropping them, trying to get to uh, a dead carp or something that was under the water. And Mary caught this. I thought that was a really cool picture. Uh, and those feet, there is bare feet. You know, he had the, the water you know, flies off of it and they don't stick the limbs. They don't stick the, you know, that people worry about that, but they really don't. Let's see. Did we do that one? Yeah. Yeah, I did that one. Okay. Yep. Yep. This will be the next one. Amanda, I think the hawk watched it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just like lions at the water hole. Uh, it, 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 you know, it, it, it's more that this a predator who sees a concentration of prey. So Cooper's hawk, Sharpshin hawk, if you're way up north, goshawks, um, they, they, they see a concentration of food and they watch it. And they learn hunting techniques to sweep in and, and grab one. And it's just, like I said, it's like lions in the water hole in the Serengeti. The, the, all those gazelles around the water drinking, the lions wait, and then they ambush one or two, they get their food. So um, that, that's why cover being so close, uh, it, escape cover is definitely important. How do I, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah they, they, guys, deep. well, the two articles, the, the fox one and the, the sparrow one, unfortunately, are no longer in print. And I, you know, so um, if you contacted the Missouri Department of Conservation, you could possibly ask if they have any old copies uh, uh, in the still in there. I had a whole slew of the uh, sparrows articles for years, but I finally have given those all out. And I just have a few of the, the, the Fox articles too. So thank you for asking. I, those, those were fun. Maybe we could ask to the reprint them. Who's that? Maybe we should. Oh, ask the yeah, we yeah. maybe we can ask the conservation department if they'd allow us to reprint. Tell we Carrie to that. put that on the reminder list. <laughs> I think she heard you. All right, let's see. let's see. You guessed it. You're in Florida. I'm telling you, when you're talking about palm warblers and pine warblers, that's uh, yeah, there. That's hi, doing. Denise. Welcome in. I have you enjoying all the red winged blackbirds coming in this week. Uh, Gulf just haven't been. That yeah, it's it's a. It, they, it's amazing. And it, but again, red winged blackbirds don't typically come to feeders a lot in winter. They're mainly out in fields and wetland areas, especially. But when conditions get harsh, here they come. And they, 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 they're they optimistic. They've got to take advantage of it, too. And, they, and somebody said to me today, they said, oh, I get the impression you don't like morning doves. I know I love morning doves. I like, you know, a couple of morning doves in my feeders. I don't like 30 morning doves in my feeders. And that's when I get frustrated with them. And that's, I think that's true with you guys, too. It's like, and the same thing with red wings. I love red wing blackbirds. They're beautiful. They're, they're first cousins to Orioles. Uh, but whenever they come in the spring and there's 40, 50 of them in your yard and, and all over the feeders and, and making a mess, and they, it gets a bit frustrating. It's not that I don't like them, but I, they can be frustrating. All right. Jerry, let's see. Blue Jays, nut hatches, woodpecker, chickadees, go Enjoy. Oh, yeah. It's been quite a show. I mean, bird feeding, you know, the number one reason you feed birds is because you want to draw them in as so, so that you can see them closer because they bring us love and joy and they brighten up a, a, a cold, dreary winter day. But man, I mean, it, 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 it's conditions like this. When you're feeding, you're truly giving back to bird populations. Unfrozen water, and I don't know if you saw the post. I mean, you're on Facebook too, but on um, the, the the post we put up this week about Carolina wrens around here, uh, the Carolina wrens, uh, northern mockingbirds, these are southern species that during harsh, harsh stretches of weather like we're having, uh, we, we a lot of them die. And we know this from, you know, spring bird counts and breeding bird surveys. And we know that years after um, uh, these really harsh winters, their numbers are way down where they are not down as much are in urban areas or where bird feeders and the heated bird baths exist. So when we go out to parks this spring, when we go out to Western Bend State Park, where we usually hear a lot of Carolina wrens in typical years, we'll probably hear less because they probably lost some of those. They froze to death or, or, or more birds die of dehydration than actually die of uh, starvation. I've, I've heard, you've probably heard me say it many times. That's why that those heated bird baths and open sources of water are so important. Let's see. Yesterday, a flock of sandhill cranes flew over. Excellent. Kentucky. Is that normal for this time of year to still be migrating, passing through? Again, it, 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 Jennifer, it's it's interesting because the you know the eastern population uh, of uh, the sandhill cranes and and all the 
they don't get pushed as hard a lot of times as the central part uh, because the, the milder winters uh, and, 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 and the last several years. And so they, a lot of times they won't move any further south than they have to. So maybe this storm is, is pushing birds through that normally wouldn't have been moving through. Yeah. So I'm oh. just going to throw a couple of these up. Okay. People talking about what they have in their yards. Absolutely. Move we to do have Chickadees tit mice daily, but after a few months, the house sparrows found me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, house sparrows are tough. Uh, the, how, it, it, people have been asking about those too, and like I said, I, I use the can't beat them joining method. I just put millet on the ground on a bare patch away, and never put millet up in my feeders. Never put the grains up in my feeders. Only sunflower, safflower, peanuts uh, in the mixes. But try to lure those house sparrows away from your feeder if they're a bad problem for you. Another Florida. Already seeing some purple martin scouts. Oh my word! Twenty degree nice hard. And yes, they can. Um, uh, they they're hardier than you think. We, we see we have purple martins arrive here early as well, uh, uh, and a lot of times in February or, or, or early March when they and we have a really bad cold snap. And I have people who feed them. You know, they 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 raise up platforms and put uh, mealworms out there for them. I have one customer who literally goes to the bait store and buys a tube of crickets and he uses a uh, the slingshot and he takes and fires the, the uh, crickets up in the air and the martins swoop down and get them. So uh, they're, they do risk dying whenever the weather's this bad and they come back early. So hopefully they'll be able to make it. Uh, they'll move out and maybe they probably will go a little bit further south where there's some insects, uh, but yeah, that can be dangerous. Hi, Jen from Maine. Yeah, we finally had a couple of snowstorms, a lot of juncos. Yeah, the more snow, the more juncos. Yep, they've really come in, and and like the white the white throated sparrows, the uh, uh, the American tree sparrows, the song sparrows, uh, really get pushed in when they, when their roar gets covered up. Denise, you are famous, Mark. <laughs> I can't, I can't, can y'all see that number? It says 94 people. <laughs> that's blowing me away. And that's one of the reasons why we had to get Melanie to do the clicking because it, 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 so many comments, I can't, I can't get talking. And if I don't have, uh, have her helping me. So my Somebody producer got their heated bird bath today. Hey, at least, at least you got the heated bird bath. I'm telling you, you guys are using my heroes. The bird, you, you birds are. <laughs> If I you really, can recommend one, okay. Uh, yeah, all right. Yeah, I'll go find it and post it. Melody's going to put up a link. Um, uh, the the you can these guys that are ant, uh, commenting on the sides that have several. We've shipped out several in the last week or so, um, and we're trying to keep them in stock. They, uh, they you know some years. So it's funny because a couple of really mild winters, the companies don't produce as many. And then boom, we get a winter like this, and sometimes they they, they run out, you know. That, and so we have to Which find one. Them. You want me to put in there, or just do that? But just the whole, the whole page. The, page. My favorite one is the scallop bird bath. And if you watch my videos on our, my deck railing, you can see it in the the videos we put up last week of the during the snow. Uh, that's my favorite one. And Melanie's putting the link up to all the bird baths on our our online store. So the scallop one is definitely my favorite. Okay. Oh, somebody else got theirs today too. Oh, yeah. hold on, I missed one. Sorry. Yeah, excellent. Absolutely. I'm telling you. And then it, there's where I put it. And Melanie put up the link. I, 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 on a, I you know, <laughs> whenever it comes to, I, I try not to sound like the salesman. I really don't. I mean, I, I, I endorse certain products and, and, but when it, when it comes to bird bass, and you guys have heard me talk about it so much, it is absolutely critical for them. And, and, and you know, we've seen the videos, and then we've seen Kurt's uh, the video of the rusty blackbirds, and he's using a floating pond de-icer because he's got a big a frog pond that he built. And that de-icer, when it was air temperatures were 16 below the other morning, it can only keep a small area open right around that heater. But that's enough. You saw those rusty blackbirds in the video bathing in that. And then he's got other birds too. You got yellow belly sap suckers videos drinking out of it and American tree, all kinds of things. They have to have that water, and even in the coldest conditions. So you guys that are, you know, buying these bird baths uh, and, and, and keeping the water open for the birds are the real heroes because you're, you're helping a lot of birds survive uh, during these conditions. And this must be this weekend is supposed to be down. I think tomorrow morning's negative eight or something. Again, we, we're getting another shot of it. And then it's going to gradually start warming back up. It looks like uh, maybe in the forties and stuff, but it has been a really, really harsh uh, stretch here. Now, one last uh, topic, and this is going to be a funny looking bird. 
um, that I wanted to do because this is something that, that I'm passionate about, the bi my biologist background, um, and that is, it, it, it is deer. Resist the temptation to, to buy deer corn, they call it, and put it out for, the, the, for, for deer. And other mammals. Uh, and the reason why is deer in the fall, their gut or their intestines, their, their digestive tract goes through a transition because they know there's not going to be, you know, green leaves and budding trees that they like to nibble on the ends of and hostas and all this stuff, lush green vegetation. Well, their stomachs go through a, 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 a rumen, they call it, that it goes through a transition. And so they can survive off of really poor quality food. And that the, this guy and then his whole herd had been out in the yard. This backyard is full of uh, uh, black locust trees and the black locust seed pods, if you know what I'm talking about, black Circular. I put a video up on it on uh, today on Facebook, um, but they, the deer are going around pulling out these black, dry, crunchy uh, uh, seed pods, and they're eating them like crazy. Uh, and that is a perfect example of how their stomachs can survive off of really poor food, like bark and things like that. Well, people want to put out this what's called deer corn. Now, I'm not talking about just straight crack corn or 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 or, you know, corn's not that nutritious <laughs> for us anyways, or even for them. But people, you know, it's cheap. So people put out corn and uh, for the deer to eat. But this deer corn, is, it, this is uh, flavored and scented and it's got molasses on it and apple flavoring. What that stuff is made for is for deer hunters to bait pot for bait piles so the deer will get addicted to it and come in. So when they're hunting, they come in and they, they can kill the deer. Well, we we did sell it at one point, and the conservation department said, "Don't." <laughs> and I said, "Oh God, I, I'm so stupid." I mean, I learned, I knew all this from college, but I wasn't even thinking along that line. But these deer corn, this sweetened corn, is terrible for deer because their gut can't handle it this time of year, and it can make them really sick. So we don't sell it, and I'd really I'd discourage you from uh, from doing that. Uh, they, they, we care about their health too. They're amazing creatures and they are so much tougher than we give them credit for and they can, they survive. Uh, and I know it may, I guess that they take tugs on our heartstring and we want to help them like we do other animals, but uh, be smart about it. Don't, don't give in and don't feed, um, the, the, the really the sweetened things like that, the molasses covered deer corn. That's, that's my message there. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's a question. That one. All right. I have my bird bath where I can see it and I have a, the icer, but it doesn't get a lot of traffic. Well, merely it could, like I said, my, my key to the successful bird baths are how close is it to cover? They have to feel safe at this in the wide open uh, where uh, like aerial predators, like the hawks and things can get them. Uh, they're less likely to use it or only use it very quickly. When you've got uh, bushes or shrubs, like the old Christmas tree, you know, discarded Christmas tree, something like that close to it, uh, it helps a lot. But that's my first guess. Uh, make sure that the icer is functioning properly. You don't want that uh, to be so hot that the, the birds are shying away from it. Like I said, they, they have good ones have thermostats and they go on and off at about 36 to 38, depending on the company. Um, but they, they that, that water is not supposed to be hot. So it, it, it makes sure your, your de-icer is functioning properly. Okay. The next one, somebody's asking. Can please add? A yeah. The, which I need to figure out which is she's asking for a tube feeder with a cage on it. Okay. So yeah. That, that, that right. I, Denise, I can tell you right now. Uh, the K we had, we have a couple of cages, but my company that I get my cages from are totally out on their website when I tried to order last week. Um, but we do have, um, some, uh, the tube feeders that we have three, typically three different size cages. So you can put, there's three different size feeders that fit in them and we can get you all that information. I will, that, that she's going to try to go online. So, we don't have the cages online simply because we can't get them right now. So, but the feeders we can. And uh, but I will get your information and so try to get you to contact. Do I post 
the two feeders that are the seed feeders and the finch because I don't know which one she wants. Yeah. It, 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 are you looking for a finch feeder or a tube feeder? So Melanie's going to put up the, uh, the multi seed for sunflower and things like that. And then I'll do the other yeah. one too. Yeah. All right. We're getting way behind, aren't we? Sorry. Pulling the peanut side of the wire mesh feeder. They're fun to watch. I love it. My uh, my peanut, uh, my blue jays, I'm going out and laying a bunch of peanuts on the on the deck railing. And uh, they, boy, as soon as I'm out and leave the deck and walk inside, they're out there cleaning them off. That's great. Do we want to tell her, too, if she wants to call the store mm -hmm. and she can talk to Yeah, they, and or, that, that, Denise, you can Evan. always, uh, in, in the information below, call the store and we can walk you through it. We can, we can even FaceTime you and show you what we have. What state are you in? If I've never seen fox sparrows, Sandy. Yeah, they, they, fox sparrows are pretty secretive sparrows. They're all through the South. So she's asking us what state we're yeah. in. We're in Missouri. No, she's asking Joshua. Oh, state she was asking Joshua. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, doing too many, really I'm doing too many things too much at one time. Too much at one time. Yeah, exactly. Jerry, yeah, the Blue Jays are spoiled. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Yes. That, that Blue Jays can be that way. <laughs> That's for sure. Same over to it's a cold snap. Yep. That, it, yeah, absolutely, Mario. That that they, finding unfrozen water is a premium. I mean, every little puddle of water is frozen solid. Even uh, you know, running streams. It, it's very hard to find unfrozen water. <laughs> Well, thank you, Steve. Yeah, I mean, I, I often tell, convinced I'm my own worst salesman. I talk people out of Purple Martin houses all the time. And yeah, I, thank you. I picked up my discard tree down the street and put, there you go. Perfect, Janet. That is, I'm telling you. And if you need a discarded uh, a Christmas tree, you don't have one. It depends on where you live, but you go to an area lake. Most uh, lakes have drop-off points for uh, Christmas trees, and they actually sink them into lakes for, for fish cover. And there's tons of them, and you can just throw one in your car and back of your truck or whatever and bring it home and use it. And then take it back out there if you want to after you're through with it. Shallow bird bath. That, uh, and they have peanuts. Okay, yep. So they stay. Tell her about the squirrel drinking out of our bird bath. Yeah, it was so funny. We, we tried to get a good picture of him the other day, but the – the, the squirrel sneaks up onto our deck railing and he's on behind the heated bird bath. And, and when he drinks out the bird bath, all you can see is his head. I mean, you can't even see his body. And all you see is just lick, he's licking the, the water. He's really, it was really funny. I was trying so hard to get a picture. Yes. Yeah. House finches. It, 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 it is. I think we're caught up. We're caught up. Yay. I don't know what else you need to do. All right, guys. Well, I, I tried to, that's all I tonight. I try to keep it about 45 minutes. Look at there, 47. So, you guys, thanks so much. Uh, and if I did not get to answer a question for you, I am so sorry. We are, like I said, it's getting pretty crazy. You know, we it, it, the number, and, and we so thank you. And we so appreciate you giving us likes and shares and those kind of things. Tell people about it. The channel is growing, and that's so exciting that you, you guys want to help help birds that much. So it, absolutely. Thank you for the support. Thank you for the questions. Again, always send in ideas of um, program for uh, actual programs. And uh, that way I can uh, know what you want to talk about. I know we got one coming up with Mary and we're going to talk about cameras. Um, she's been doing some research for me and she's a wealth of knowledge and uh, she's got one in her yard. And so we're going to talk about cameras at bird feeders and, and what ones work the best. Get, we'll and things. try to get some links. And stuff. Yeah, we'll try to get some links together. Like I said, we don't share them at the store. Hey, sell them at the store. So, all right. Thank you guys. It, 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 John, I appreciate you, you tuning in. I hope you learned something tonight and, and uh, we will be back on in two weeks uh, at, at live, but we'll have more videos between now and then. You are, guys are also welcome. Thank you for tuning in. And if you can, come on, let's talk birds. <laughs>